It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Hood Museum of Art's Artist Lecture, Seeing New Things, presented by Louise Hamlin, Professor Emeritus of Studio Art at Dartmouth. My name is Alice Crow, and I am the Levinson Intern for Campus Engagement. Outside of interning at the Hood, I am a history and studio art double major, and as a painter myself, I'm especially excited to be introducing this talk. There will be a Q&A near the end of the program, and we invite you to join us for reception in the Russo Atrium following the lecture. At this time, I'd like to remind everyone to turn off your cell phones or set them to silent. Also, please note the emergency exit to my left and those at the back of the auditorium. And now I invite Amelia Call, Barbara C. and Harvey P. Hood, 1918 Curator of Academic Programming and Curator of the Exhibition to the podium. Thank you, Alice, for the warm welcome to everyone here tonight. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Louise Hamlin. Um, because much of Louise's art is based on the land, and specifically on the land of the Upper Valley, a place that many of us currently call home, it is important for us to acknowledge that the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth is situated upon the ancestral and unceded lands of the Abenaki people. This acknowledgement reminds us of the significance of place the continued existence of indigenous people and the museum and Dartmouth's commitment to building respectful relationships with those who call these lands home today. In the spirit of the land acknowledgement, you can see work by indigenous artists and indigenous curators in three shows in the museum, Unbroken Native American Ceramic Sculpture and Design, This Land, American Engagement with the Natural World, and Form and Relation, Contemporary Native Ceramics. But if you're heading upstairs to the second floor, you should see, or hopefully see again, or visit again, the reason we're here tonight, Louise's show, titled In the Moment, Recent Work by Louise Hamlin. Um, it is on view on the, in the second floor until September 3rd. So lots of opportunities to come back and visit over and over again. I want to give many thanks to the Hood staff who worked on the exhibition, especially to Sue Achenbach, who did all of the framing Matthew Oates, who helped to hang and also did the lighting for the show, Nikki Gilbert, who was the registrar, and Andy Gabriziak, who worked on design. I would also like to thank our PR and external relation colleagues, Anna K. Schulte, Allison Palazzolo, and Nils Nadeau. And always great thanks to my colleague, Sharon Reed, who is facilitating tonight's talk and reception. And now to Louise. I met Louise many years ago when I first... <laughs> Many years ago, <laughs> when I first, no, I'm talking more, you're not, you're not, you got another minute, you got another minute. So I, I met Louise many years ago when I first started at the museum working in academic programming, and she had been teaching at the college for a few years at that point. She started teaching here at Dartmouth in 1990, and through her time teaching was a staunch supporter of the museum. So Dartmouth has these 10-week terms, so they're very quick, and she would bring her class multiple times, like three times, four times over the term, and she made them go through the whole deal. They had to tramp through a parking lot, there was like a light post and a metal stairway and a door with no window, like it was quite the ordeal. So they had to go knock on this door and we'd let them in, it felt very secret. Um, we were teaching in our original Bernstein study room. And there the students, they would pour over all these prints, 17th century Rembrandts, all the way up to contemporary work. And I will say that Louise's list, the requests for these classes, were like kind of long, <laughs> a little bit longer than our typical lists. And I really owe a great debt of thanks to my colleagues for pulling them. So they'd come to me and they'd be like, well, these things really all fit in this room. <laughs> and you'd, I just, so you sort of shrug and you say, it's for Louise, right? <laughs> like we knew that she would not not get to things, but instead a little extra effort on our part would be well exceeded by the effort that she was putting into her students and her commitment to them teaching. So it was always a pleasure. So it was really with sadness in 2015 when the museum closed for renovations that I realized Louise was retiring and I said she wouldn't come visit me in the study room. Um, and so when this show came up, the opportunity to work on the show, I volunteered not realizing how precious a bright spot it would be for us during the isolation of COVID and the losses that we've all endured. So in 2021, in the midst of the pandemic, I got to visit Louise's studio, and it was the first time that I had seen art outside of the hood in many, many months, and it was really a revelation. The saturated colors of the microgreen paintings, 
the playful experimentation of the garlic scape drawings and prints, and the subtle effects of light and fog were a joyous celebration of the visual. And this is what I enjoy most about Louise's work. She, she synthesizes her close observations so although that we can identify an individual plant stem or a bridge truss, we're really taken in by the contrast between form and formlessness. From the soft organic curve of a delicate leaf, juxtaposed with the rigidity of a plastic container, whose translucency is then set against the soft geometry of a shadow. Shadows in her winter work featuring still life become fog in the summer, fog and light, natural, artificial, glowing within or reflected without. It is easy to get lost in Louise's paintings, whether in a mass of foliage or an expanse of meadow. And yet we always know where we are, either in the upper valley or perhaps simply next to a familiar herd of cows or flock of geese. And I am not the only one to have been taken in by Louise's art. She has a long list of awards, residencies, grants, exhibitions, and publications that you can read about in the catalog in the moment. Um, she had earned, she's earned a BFA from the University of Pennsylvania and studied at the New York Studio School in Paris and New York and at the Skowhegan School for Sculpture and Painting in Maine. Her work is held in numerous public collections, including here at The Hood, as well as those at Bryn Mawr College, Swarthmore College, and the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, among others. So thank you so much, Louise. Working on the show with you and your daughter, Katie Lenhart, who provided wonderful support. It has been a true pleasure. And I'm really glad that all of you have the opportunity to hear from her tonight. So it is my great honor to introduce artist and George Frederick Jewett Professor of Studio Art and Area Head of Printmaking Emerita, Louise Hamlin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You're a hard act to follow. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's astonishing to see so many of you here and a, and a very great joy. Um, despite my very long and very productive association with the Hood Museum while I was teaching, I never before realized how much goes on behind the scenes to make it so successful. I wish I had the time, and I'm glad you did, to thank everybody who was involved in this project, but I hope they know how deeply appreciative I am of all their professionalism and their generosity. Uh, I must, however, thank Director John Stomberg for making The Hood a teaching museum of the highest quality. This museum, as I was just saying to Amelia, they don't try to entertain people. They don't do things for entertainment value. They have high quality art. To, that they expose people to, and it's a very important and wonderful mission. Um, and I want to thank him also for making so many resources available to us. I'm beyond grateful to art historian and museum curator Kathy Hart for her essay. It was a marvel of breadth and a very careful attention. Also, I want to thank Vincent Katz for his thoughtful observations from the point of view of a poet who's also deeply engaged with visual art. The biggest shout out of all, though, goes to Amelia Kale, <laughs> who planned and supervised everything, working on it for well over a year now, um, along with her many other duties. Uh, she not only knew what questions to ask for an interview to make me sound smart, <laughs> but she also somehow knew which pieces to select from my crowded studio and how to group them coherently uh, in the two galleries upstairs. I made the art, but she made the show and the beautiful catalog, and is still coordinating details, large and small. I hope she's as thrilled about the result as I am, and that you take a moment to give you her, tell her your impressions after you see the work. This show is dedicated to Katie Lenhart, my daughter, friend, <laughs> collaborator, and support in good times and bad. But loving thanks also to Justin Myers for his willing help in good company, and in memory of Gary Lenhart, a wonderful man, poet, and partner. James Baldwin, in his autobiographical notes, said, one writes out of one thing only, one's own experience. Everything depends on how relentlessly one forces from this experience the last drop sweet or bitter, it can possibly give. This is the only real concern of the artist, 
to recreate out of the disorder of life that order which is art. The disorder of life affords many subjects for art. This, these are my words now. <laughs> but mine, I guess, is the intense pleasure of looking around. I like what the painter Andrew Ford called slow looking and agree with his remark that everything is interesting to look at. For me, it's not the universality of a thing that makes it engaging, but rather the individual experience of them. So that things are always different depending on who's looking, what day it is, the coincidence of time, weather, mood, health, imagination. When I sent a few recent images to Raxra Downs, a painter friend, he didn't write back that he liked them or didn't like them. He just said, you're seeing new things, which coming from somebody who looks very hard at the world pleased me immensely. Please don't be disappointed that the art upstairs is a lot, is nowhere near as big as what you're gonna see on the screen here, <laughs> nor as bright. <laughs> but I hope what's lost in size is gained in substance and has its own internal luminosity. And I hope you don't see what I see until I show it to you <laughs> so that my experience can broaden yours. And of course, I always hope that my art does justice to the great adventure of taking a really good look around. Now, let me, if I can overcome my technical anxiety, I'm going to try to proceed. Yes. <laughs> I went from one to two. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this exhibition covers about 10 years of my work, and I'll, I'll roughly go in, in um, chronological order, even though the things are really overlap. This, not in chronological order, is garlic growing at this very moment in our garden. In a short while, it's going to look like this. With the tops curl around and the um, buds appear, the seed, seed pods appear, and then they get fat and open up and the seeds go out. Uh, people now cut off the tops and, and cook them, saute them. They're called garlic scapes, the top. And I, saw, I first saw a bunch in the farm stand in Norwich, and I, they looked to me like, like movement in the basket. They looked like movement in need of choreography. <laughs> I bought a bunch and took it back to my studio and tried to figure out what to do with them. In this case, drawing was how I became acquainted with my subject. And, and also drawing was what led to some, a kind of prints that I made later on. Only, I only use drawing, a uh, pencil and an eraser, the simplest of materials, because I wanted the fewest possible technical complications to get in between me and the subject matter. I made small alterations, cutting them and arranging them um, to find out what seemed to be the visual essence of their natural form. These drawings are not in the show, but these are some of the ones I did while I was exploring that subject. This is another example. These are all pencil on paper that's roughly about 22 by 30 BFK paper. Uh, the same here, where I could use the rhythms provided by nature, but amplified by my own arrangement. And then I could also make new situations, sort of a, a theater in my studio, positioning the players to appear that they're both active and still, on a stage set with artificial light, creating shadows, adding tone, or what people sometimes call shading, uh, with pencil, still with pencil. But I also experimented exploring this subject matter with charcoal, a truly basic material. Um, it's, it's literally vines that have been roasted. <laughs> um, it allows, and sometimes they're, sometimes use them just plain as, as vine charcoal, and sometimes they're compressed together to make a more dense charcoal. Um, it, charcoal allows much more density of tone and touch. Um, and you can move around a lot more and use your hands with your and your fingers. In this one, the brightest white in the garlic buds, is, uh, the, white, the brightest white is in the buds where it's been erased out. It's not in the background of the page like in the others. Um, so what happens with the garlic scapes is these buds open like that and then the seeds go out and spread 
and if they were in a work <laughs> in a better environment than my studio, they would grow again. Um, this is still in black and white. I kept exploring different different ways to to actually explore the subject. This is slightly larger than the 22 by 30. This is about 40 by 32, and this is in the show. I taught printmaking for many years, and in the printmaking studio, we use carborundum grits to to uh, grind the images off litho stones, or we used to, it's kind of an outdated tradition now. But anyway, there are all these carborundum grits in the studio, and I mix them with shellac, and I actually made a drawing that was painting with shellac and carborundum grits. So um, you can't touch this because it's covered with a, luckily it's framed now, but if you did touch it, it would feel like sandpaper. <laughs> so take a look when you go up and see this one, take a look at closely and you'll see that it's made with little tiny bits of carborundum. I also moved into a little, while continuing my exploration of this material, tried a little bit of color with some acrylic paint on a small, this is really a 10 by 10 inch board, um, where the forms are extracted, they're abstracted enough. I felt it was sort of a, an assignment in, in design, giving myself my own, <laughs> own homework assignment in basic design. These, um, these three are in the show. I found in the end that pencil was the most expressive medium for me for drawing these, the, the wonderful delicacy and vigor and particular qualities of this subject. So these are in the show and you can see them for yourself upstairs. I won't dwell on them any longer. Um, this drawing is in the show, plus a little painting, an oil painting this time that I also did on one of those 10 by 10 boards, trying to just explore the subject in different ways. There's a, there's a wonderful seduction about color and paint. Um, but it does, I find if I compare the two, the, the paint does diminish the linear uh, subtleties and the elegance of the pencil. I'm not saying that one is better than another, but they're different. Wanting to combine the linearity of the pencil drawing with a very measured amount of color, I began to make large prints from my pencil drawings. Uh, the plate is covered with ink, which is held in certain places by uh, the incised marks that are on the plate, and then either selectively or completely wiped off. Uh, inking and wiping, so this, the plate that made this was completely covered with, with ink, green ink, and I had to wipe it off. Every area of, of light is where I wipe the ink away on the plate. So you can imagine that inking and wiping these plates, which are about these big, is a very long and very demanding process. Uh, these two prints made from the same plate show the very subtle distinctions you can make simply by changing the ink and the paper color. Prints are a wonderful sustained activity in the winter. You can uh, reinvent and reinvestigate summer subjects uh, when they're no longer available and when it's too cold to work outside. This pencil drawing is also in the show. It's perhaps the most elaborate dance in the series. I call it Baroque Bouquet. You can see all the seed pods are ready to, ready to fly off the seeds. And this is the print on the left is the print I made from that drawing. And in, on the right is me <laughs> in, in Thayer School of Engineering. <laughs> Dartmouth truly enables its professors to practice what they teach by providing incredible resources. As an art professor, I never expected to spend long hours in the machine room at Thayer. I didn't even know where, what it was. <laughs> but Kevin Barron and Pete Fontaine in this picture made it possible for me to laser cut scanned drawings onto plexiglass plates, which I could then ink and wipe like a traditional uh, metal etching plate. This showed a photo shows the drawing in my left and on your right is the actual, the original drawing. And then in the middle, we're talking about the print, which I made. And you can see under Pete's hand, you can see there's a, a transparent piece of plexiglass with some traces of green on it. That's the printing plate that, was, that I actually had laser cut in that machine shop. It was a great treat to explore a new way of printmaking here. And then for my students to have the same great opportunity Thank you, Kevin, he, for thinking that artists and engineers made a good mix. He really believed it. And to literally add a new dimension to these prints, I made a few in three dimensions. Um, 
to explain this process, the darker image, I painted that one first, the darker green image that you see mostly on the top and behind the lighter image. I printed that onto a sheet of paper. Um, I, I, conscious, I purposely left some ink inside the stems to give them a sign, as well as on the outside, but leave, left some on the inside to give a sense of the color of the stems. And then I printed the, again, the image again on a different sheet of paper, but this time I wiped it out more carefully so that the tone wouldn't appear in the stems. And then I cut that image out very carefully along all the edges, and that's what you see here. It's the second printing on top of the first one, separated by a thin layer of a foam material that I also cut in the exact same shape. <laughs> it took a long time and a lot of exacto blades. <laughs> I think now, I think, oh, I bet, I bet the machine shop could have done that. They could have <laughs> cut that on a machine in five minutes. I never even, it never even occurred to me. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, um, it gave a, a different dimension, uh, literally a different dimension to the print, which I thought was interesting. This is upstairs in the show, too. Um, and, and then I, I thought I'd just show you how I, one of the ways I set up things. The garlic scapes uh, withered and dried up after a while, but I thought they looked interesting and lively and very sprightly even then. Um, and I'm getting more, <laughs> more attached to to things and people who are sprightly in their old age, <laughs> uh, as, <laughs> hoping to be that way. Um, so I wanted to explore them in this state. So the way that I set these up was I taped them onto this uh, big sheet of white board. Uh, I put the tape, I let, draped them over the top and made a kind of a curtain out of it that I taped to the board. And, and you can actually see in the top left-hand corner, there's a drawing. You can see there's a, one of the drawings that's on the wall behind it. Um, and, and then on the right is the pencil drawing that I made sitting in front of it, literally drawing it with pencil <laughs> and deciding what I wanted in the image or not. That drawing is not in the show. And on the left here is the, uh, I printed it in orange ink I, um, over in the studio art printmaking studio, wiping off all the extra tones to keep the, the background white. And then I also, through marvelous digital flexibility, I was able to cut, laser cut a smaller plate from the same scanned image. Um, and this, and that's what's on the right-hand side. I made a print from the smaller plate of the exact same image, but this time I, pay, I printed it on black paper and I used silver ink. Now, <laughs> these variations barely touch on the possibilities that printmaking offers but there were plenty enough in, in, within this small range to keep me busy. And here are two different images uh, from this series. They're, they're uh, laser cut onto different plates. The background one, the very light pale green, pale yellow green one was printed first on one, from one plate. And then I inked a second plate in the darker green and printed it in a second run through the press right on top of the first one. So you can get all, I mean, as I say, this is barely, literally scratching the surface. I found this drawing nice in parts, but not entirely convincing. I did uh, get, uh, I did scan it and, and have a cut a laser plate with it though, and then used it to uh, create this uh, 3D, pr 3D image both positive and negative processes. The positive is, are the green, the green stems is where I inked the plate up and printed them positively, but behind that, you can see where the ink is in the spaces in between the stems, and the stems are actually just white, but this, it's the spots in between them that I printed instead of the stems themselves. Um, the vase is a monotype print that I made. I, I, <laughs> I spent a couple days making fake vases. I felt like I was in a ceramic studio instead of a printmaking shop. I tried all these different shapes and ways of making vases and I finally got one that I liked that, that I put into this. And this is also put on a piece of foam so it rises up a little bit from the surface. I'd investigated fruits and vegetables before. At the same farm stand um, earlier, I'd found these astonishing Romanesco cauliflowers, which I had never seen before, and they, they looked like some relic that from an ancient time, it would, they were so bizarre. They're very, they're delicious. <laughs> they're very dramatic forms, so I wanted to explore them in my studio. And these are six of the drawings. These are 22 by 30 uh, on, in charcoal on Reeves BFK white paper. 
that are very different in mood, I think, from the garlic scapes. Uh, this is another uh, exploration of, of fruit. Um, referring to the French painters Bonnard and Vuillard, the art critic Peter Scheldahl mentioned their, quote, passionate absorption in the visual realities of daily life. I share that absorption, and because of it, I know I'll never run out of subject matter. Here, interested not only in the spirited cherries and the stems, but also through the plastic container in that blend of natural and artificial that's in so much of my own imagery, and also that informs every corner of our world as never before at this moment. This is an aquatint etching. It's only uh, about 15 by 11 inches. I saw these collections of microgreens arranged in the containers by the grower, not by me, at Dana Witt's general store in Norwich. And I brought them to my studio just for the fun of it, um, one at a time, on rainy, especially on rainy days. I wanted to get away from all the green that was surrounding me every day when I went out uh, to my outdoor painting sites. Um, and I mentioned before uh, the combination of natural and artificial. There are many layers of artifice here. I put bright, I wanted color. I was thirsty for color. So I put brightly colored sheets of tissue paper underneath the, the containers. And then I'd clamp, I put clamp lights around, positioned uh, to maximize the shadows. The, another artificial ingredient are the plastic containers themselves, of course, containing natural plant forms, but then artificially arranged in this quiet domestic drama. Um, <clears throat> the small scale allowed me to finish these paintings in two to three days. Uh, I could just put them in the refrigerator overnight and they would stay fresh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and they were a great pleasure. It was really fun and, it, you know, while I was also doing large paintings outside, it was a great joy to come in and do small ones indoors. I also like seeing them as a group, um, and, and where they combined, as a group, they combined to have a kind of a larger presence. So I thought, I wondered how each one would change if I made each one of the small ones, and there are, the small ones are, oh, I think 16 inches square. Um, I wanted to know what would happen if I made the small ones big. So uh, I enlarged them in the Renaissance tradition, which I had learned on the job while I was working for a, a mural painter in New York City when I was a young artist. Um, you'd, in this case, you divide both paintings. The paintings are to scale with each other. I divide both paintings in, into vertical and horizontal uh, quarters, taping the string over the little painting on the left. So I didn't want to actually draw on it, so I just taped string the grid and string over it. And then in the bigger one, just with very pale diluted ink, drew the grid on that. And um, you can the first rough translation from large to small, from small to large, is uh, a tr you can go within each box of the grid and sort of roughly get the shapes that are in that box on the smaller one. Um, and that works fine in the beginning, but if you continue that way, it gets very stilted and boring, and you just end up copying the small one on the big one. But when things change in scale and size, there are different demands that are made. So once I got the thing positioned in a way that felt right, and, and even that was different in the big one than the small one, I, I erased the lines, took off the strings, and, and started the painting with the big one, let the big one find its own way. Um, certainly there were bigger brushes, more paint, different touch required, but also different compositional things. I, th I thought I'd explain show these two, and this is what the rel relative scale is actually like, how the big ones compare to the small ones in actual, the small ones about as third as, as third as tall as the big ones. So from a distance, you look at the big one and the small one, and they look pretty close, they look pretty identical, but they're not. If I blow up the small one to be the s next to the big one, um, you can see, to me anyway, it doesn't carry, it loses force. It's the ingredients are enlarged, um, but somehow the painting feels less robust at this scale. The light and the color seem less vivid. Um, the ingredients seem less well, happy and <laughs> busy. And the presence just seems less commanding when, you, when I just simply blow it exactly up. So you can see here the changes that I made blowing it up. The one on the left is the larger one. 
and it had to be developed on its own to have its own, even though it began just like the other one, it couldn't end up like the other one and be successful, at least to me. Uh, when you, upstairs, I only made three of the big ones. They're all upstairs, as are the five small ones. They're in the show. So you can look for yourselves and see the difference if, there, if you see any. Um, um, as I mentioned before, the combined presence of natural and artificial seems ubiquitous in our world and consequently informs a lot of my work. I'll just take a quick look back at some different um, combinations of natural and artificial in previous work of mine. Since everybody sees differently or responds differently, a miracle of color, air, and light to one person is a piece of discarded plastic trash to another. To me, this fence is both substance and absence. The material intrigued me for many years. I, I bought a roll of it at a highway supply store, <laughs> and I set it up in various places outdoors. <laughs> If anybody's interested, by the way, I have a lot of it left. <laughs> I'm not using it anymore. <laughs> it's, it's under our deck. <laughs> I'm happy to give it to you. <laughs> um, and then while I was doing that, this time I moved from macro, which would be the big fences, to micro, which are these little nets, which are exactly the same thing. They were little plastic grids um, with airs. And, and I thought, this is the same thing. It's just in miniature. And, um, and they're much more easy to manipulate than the big fences. And you could, I could, put, I could manipulate, manipulate them with various natural materials in a very different way. Here, uh, it feels like the netting sort of tames the sweet little crab apples inside. And here, the very insubstantial net visually solidifies the density and weight of an onion. And here, the light through the grid dissolves rock. <laughs> and while the curves of the fence suggested to me the solidity of air. This is a monotype print. The most dramatic and by far the largest netting I found was up in Fairley, where a very high cliff is partially covered with a veil of steel mesh, meant to keep the rocks from falling on the highway. Um, to me, this image is not about wrapping something huge like Christo did, but about visual transformation. How the veil of steel makes the hard rocks appear soft. It was an engaging technical challenge too for a painter, how to make a color that looks like rock seen through mesh. <laughs> you can't just paint rocks and then smear white or gray paint over it to make it look like mesh because it just looks like a mess. And it doesn't have the magic. You have to find the right colors to describe how things are seen simultaneously in a way that transforms each of them. The work in this show goes back about 10 years. Um, this, this, is, this is the one that was begun the longest ago. Looking out of the third floor studio, I had a win, uh, studio in the Whitman Press Building in, in Lebanon, and looking down from the third floor where I, my studio window was, I looked down on the section of the Mascoma River that, that flowed by there and powered the mills that used to be there. Um, and I could see how this section of the river changed in different seasons. In this case, autumn is yielding to winter, and the ice is starting to form close to the rocks, as the water is still fairly warm, but the ice is starting to grow out from the rocks uh, as the river starts to ice over. There's a, a, a the, the contrast here is these delicate, delicate changes of color in the ice and in the water compared to the sort of violent, almost jagged edges of the ice and the dark colors where the water pools up. I changed studios, however, before this painting was finished, so the reason it's in this show is that I finished it a couple years ago uh, from Norwich, from my studio on the ground floor in Norwich, and especially the bottom part I had to finish up, and it was a great, in interesting challenge to me. I felt a little liberated, because I'd always felt I had to stand right in front of my subject in order to see it. So it was a great um, exercise. Even though it looks so highly realistic, to me it was a great exercise in imagination to make it all work together. Um, these are two more from this series. On the upper left uh, is the one that I just showed you. Um, this gives you a sense of the change that occurred on that very small stretch of water. The in, what's in common with these is there's a little tree 
two little trees that are growing right there in the middle, and you can see them in each of these. And there's also the, the broken sort of dam there that makes the waterfall. Um, so the, there, there's the one that I showed you already on the left. On the top right is what it looks like in the winter when it and it actually there's some there's some water there but it, eventually it gets completely covered up and then in the spring on the bottom is what happens in the spring the water comes rushing down and it looks totally different it was a great adventure to stand there and paint these and I could be inside which was really nice too <laughs> um, I've always been intrigued about the world around me and always painted outside. So when I moved, my studio moved to Norwich, I looked around and found a more verdant site. Um, I found this wonderful spot en route uh, to a friend's house and did this mid-sized painting there. Uh, but, and I was gonna, I was very happy there on this little bridge and um, was gonna do some more paintings, but somebody brought, bought the land cut down most of the trees and put a house up. <laughs> so the particular magic was gone for me, uh, and I looked around for another situation. Um, so as I said, I've always painted outside. Uh, when, I, when I moved to Norwich, I looked around closer to home and found a sweet spot on New Boston Road, just a little bit above the Norwich dump, <laughs> um, where I could climb down the bank and be in this stream bed. Uh, these, little, these are small paintings. They don't look small here, but they are smaller than the ones upstairs. They're studies that I made. They felt like first dates. They were little studies you have to become acquainted with a place just to decide if you want to spend more time together or not, <laughs> and if they're interesting and engaging, and if they you know, feel compatible with you. Um, so uh, I went there and I did these. The one on the left is in the springtime. The one in the middle is in the summer, and the one on the right was in the summer, but in the evening as the light changed. I just realized while putting these images together a couple days ago, how the streams that I paint now are similar to, um, in, function, in visual function, to the streets I painted in New York City 40 years ago. <laughs> in, in many of these street paintings in New York, which also happened to be in mist and fog, um, the, uh, uh, streets leading into the, into the subject matter rather than some paintings keep the viewers at a distance, like you're viewing the view out there, but I found without thinking about it that my streets and streams are kind of pulling you in, not letting you stay far away. Um, this, the, up in the upper left is the spring study that I showed you before. I liked it a lot, and, I, and so I stretched a larger canvas, and these are the relative scales of these two canvases. The, the big one's upstairs, the little one isn't in this show. Um, I stretched a larger canvas for a bigger version of it, but it took too long to paint. I started making a spring painting, but <laughs> the time flew by <laughs> and it became an early summer painting instead. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a later summer painting, uh, the different kind of light in the later summer, and it leads to a different kind of precision, a different, different quality of edge, a different quality of surface, and definitely a different quality of light and color and definitely different relationships of forms and space, which sounds very formal, but it's really true. All of these, four of these big paintings are upstairs, and I love the way Amelia grouped them so you can really see the differences. They're close enough, so you can, far enough apart to read on their own, but close enough so you can really see how they're all truly different from each other, even though they're all painted from the exact same spot. I, I spent two years in that stream bed, two summers in that stream bed, and, um, was always enchanted with it, always experienced the, slight, the sight slightly differently, the light, the color, and the density. These paintings don't really have a focus. They're not about something surrounded by something else. They're about the whole thing. Um, there is, to borrow a phrase from the painter of Rackstraw Downs, a quote, democracy of attention that can coalesce a thousand moments into one. This, here's another change of season from the same spot. This is upstairs also. The autumn's famously dramatic change of color in this area was irresistible in the stream bed, as it was on the misty hills. The mist made me aware of another aspect of fall in the upper valley, which I had lived here for many years and not even really noticed or paid any attention to. 
um, how the mist collects, especially along the rivers and in the crevices between the hills. There was a precedent in my work, actually, which I hadn't thought of for years. This was 15 years before, or maybe 20 years before, when I was teaching in uh, an American university's art program in Italy, in Umbria. The Umbrian landscape's not unlike ours. It's a little more dramatic, but there are lots of uh, quick hills and, and little valleys. And in the fall, in the fall, uh, the fog just pours through the mountains, through the crevices in the mountains, and climbs up the hills. And it's very dramatic and beautiful. These are small paintings I made while I was there teaching. And then this one was made from a third floor balcony, watching this, the mist and the fog pour into the city of Siena. The fog rolls in, and then it gradually lifts up into the air. It's, it was really magical. But, but Similar things could be found up here. <laughs> uh, years later, I rediscovered the phenomena up here in the Connecticut Valley, particularly along the rivers. The mix of, where along the rivers especially, the mix of cold air and warm water, or vice versa, creates the blankets of mist. Um, they're as visible as an object, but impossible to touch. I began looking at them, I began looking for elevated sites that I could look down on these, and I did several paintings of that. These are not in the show. Oh, this one's in the show. Um, but then I realized I wanted, I preferred to be in the mist instead of above it. Um, <laughs> and I did these, I did some painting, and then I started doing my fog paintings. This, I started, I found this site on Pirouette Farm in Norwich. I was really interested in how the, trees and the grass and everything changed their quality in the mist, how they became tangible but intangible at the same time. And I was painting this, and uh, a flock of geese landed right in front of me one day while I was painting this hillside. And miraculously, they stayed for a couple of days, which was a treat for me because I got to do a couple of paintings. And I hadn't put creatures in before, but I realized this is what something that was missing from my paintings. They were scenic views, but these are inhabited landscapes. <laughs> so I was very happy to have them inhabited with these geese. And the, the challenge and interest always was how much can you suggest a landscape by barely, and, 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 so, and suggest the solidity and density of a landscape with hardly anything, with hardly any touch. How, can, how much could be suggested but still have a presence? And the trees sort of not described, but becoming disturbances in the air. When I told a friend about my new fog series, he said, fog always seemed to me to be about the absence of color. But maybe it's more like exquisite minimalism. Fog, I thought, is like color holding its breath. It skims along the surface and marries all the forms. It rises to dissolve high off the ground and reveal the day's blue sky. This is the Ledger Bridge seen from the uh, Norwich side of the river. How much can I suggest without describing? How much can the mist channel up from the surface of the water? How can I make substance out of absence? How can I dissolve form into air? This is not in the show. A friend invited me to paint from her house on the Connecticut River near Lyme. Again, uh, I, I was surrounded by fog rather than looking down on it. And I loved the blurred distinctions of the landscape elements and the subtleties of color. Fall is barely hinted at, but very present here. It's a little pixelated from the enlargement, but you get the sense. It kind of looks like it's intentional. Uh, looking the other direction from, at, from Stina's house, the Lime Bridge was also transformed. This is a very small painting, um, not this big. was also transformed by fog. And I thought the, the softening of the forms <laughs> created a mysteriously fluid geometry out of the whole. Um, and the, this, this kind of geometry is very unlike the geometry of my plastic fencing, but I thought equally transformative. Very early one morning, I was driving back to that site because I wanted to do another painting of the Lime Bridge. And I, I drove by, and I thought maybe I had been hallucinating. And I, because I saw this strange thing glowing in the, this was like 6 o'clock in the morning, 5.30 in the morning. 
And I thought on my left, I saw this strange shape glowing in the dark. And I thought either a spaceship has landed or I'm, <laughs> this is too early for me to be out driving. So I, I, I turned around and went back to look. And sure enough, it, I was not hallucinating. It was Long Wind Farm. These were uh, greenhouses, plastic greenhouses, semicircular plastic greenhouses at Long Wind Farm where, um, where they, uh, where they grow tomatoes all year long. I found out later after working there for a while that in these plastic greenhouses is where they grow the seedlings. And then when the seedlings get big enough, they turn the lights out and move the, move the seedlings back into a very contemporary modern building in the back, which has strings going up to the ceiling, huge, like a cathedral of strings, and the vines climb in there. And it's, I'm hoping I can paint in there some winter, but I haven't asked them yet. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure about mineral spirits and organic tomatoes. It might not be a good mix. <laughs> um, so the indoor lights here create these marvelous patterns uh, on the plastic wall, which I found to be another wonderful blend of nature and artifice, actually on several different levels. Um, this rural industry carries on while people are mostly still sleeping and reminded me of the nighttime pulp and paper mills I painted years ago when I first moved up to this area. Uh, and you can see their similarities of the smoke and the steam. Uh, there's smaller plumes of smoke in the uh, Long Wind Farm than there are in this, uh, in this painting and larger streams of, of mist. But there are similarities and certainly similar aspects of transformation. And even further back to paintings that I I just hadn't realized how consistent <laughs> the, the interest was. It's kind of comforting and kind of scary. Um, <laughs> this was a painting of a smokestack down in uh, lower Manhattan. And I was fascinated with how the steam and mist transformed Manhattan and never thought I would be doing it in Vermont, in New Hampshire, and Maine. <clears throat> but back to Long Wind Farm, this, these are in the show. This was painted at the break of day. It's not quite light, not quite dark. Uh, a marvelous suspension of time and atmosphere. The light cast is cast here on the outside of the greenhouse as well as coming from the inside, um, as, in, as in most cities where you can see lights on the outside and the inside. As in, other, as in cities, there's a conglomeration of architecture uh, with sort of muted suggestions of, of life and purpose within. This is how I started this is how my paintings start. I do little tiny studies in pencil to figure out what shape canvas I want, but I don't actually do finished drawings um, ahead of time. I, I do the sketches, I'm sh I stretch up the canvas, and then I begin by drawing with thin paint like this on, on the, right on the canvas, searching for the biggest shapes, the strongest um, edges, and the hints of color that I might develop later when I combine it all. This was as far as I got before the weather changed and the mist just disappeared. <laughs> so uh, the magic did too, of at least the kind of magic that I was involved with. And, and I hope to make more progress on this painting when the mists return. This is the last one that I completed in this series. Um, while I was painting there in the early morning hours, people came to work. They either drove down this road or they walked down this road and they went into the buildings and went about their business. Um, they were as, like the geese, they were as much a part of the enterprise as the buildings and the lights. And I wanted to put them in, but I didn't want to feature them. It's very hard to put people in a painting and not have the, the rest of the painting sort of revolve around the people. <laughs> it's hard to have, people demand attention. So I did some pencil studies of how Jesse, who was the farm manager, would walk down this road back to the back buildings. And then I took the painting home and I painted him in and in my studio at home. And I painted him in and took him out and in and out and in and out many times. At first he was too big, then he was too small, and then he was too bright, and then he was too dark. <laughs> and I was trying to get him in scale with the buildings, but also enveloped in the same mist so that he was barely discernible when you first looked at this painting. You didn't look at it as a man going to work surrounded by buildings, you saw the environment, oh, and then in it, oh, there's a man going to work. And that's really the experience I wanted to get, and it was very hard. <laughs> but this painting is in the show. 
Like the geese, uh, these creatures are going about their business without being aware of me looking at them. <laughs> uh, they're moving in a single line from, unlike the geese, they're moving in a single line from left to right. This is in this show, this painting. Um, probably not only oblivious to me, but to the mists behind them and to the bright, bright green of the uh, springtime meadow. <clears throat> Placing them so high up increases for me the pain. <laughs> These, this painting is not abstract, but it made it more abstract to me to have this big shape of color at the bottom. Uh, the, large, the, most, the Most of the painting is a big shape, green shape. Um, and the, the, the cows are not the main actors uh, that the landscape is, surrounds. They're more like a decorative frieze along the top. Here's another look at creatures going about their business. Again, in a single file from right to left, in a particular place, but this time surrounded by mists. They're not alone, however. I don't know if you can tell, but on the bottom right, there's a white line that indicates another boat is coming alongside. No doubt it was hard work for them, but for me, on the Norwich bank of the river, it was a ballet of shoulders, arms, and oars, of figures enveloped in mists, that blurred distinctions between water and woods, and the transforming the mass of trees into hints of color and shape as insubstantial as the mist itself. This is a small study, 13 by 15 inches. And of course, I couldn't not think about this painter. Having gone to college in Philadelphia and seen the boathouses along the Schuylkill River, of course, remembered that Thomas Aikens, a rower himself, had painted crew boats um, on the, on the Schuylkill, Schuylkill River. I looked up his paintings and was amazed to see that he too painted another boat coming alongside in this one. Um, I, I didn't know that <laughs> when I painted mine. Um, maybe in his it was more about competition than, than a shared training experience. Um, Aikens too, I read, made, more study, made a lot of studies on site and then he finished the paintings inside the studio. In his case, he probably used some well-muscled models in the studio to get these guys um, correctly, which may contribute to the sort of posed look of the two men. His work and my, his take on these on this subject is very different from mine. He's, his is a public spectacle, sort of iconic, uh, on a sunny day with a clear focus of each element and dozens of details to look at and enjoy. His, invents, his in event includes spectators and star performers. Mine is not at a distance, not a spectacle, not an impression, but an intimate engagement with nature on the water and in the air. And the mists sort of envelop the viewer as well as the subject matter. I wanted to make a large painting of this also. Um, the, the, the study is 13 by 15 inches, and the, the larger painting is 40 by 50, and I just wanted to show you how the larger painting starts. Again, with diluted paint, sort of, I don't draw it out and transpose the drawing, I actually start feeling it out with the paint as I go, um, and with very dilute paint, just, you know, very relaxed. Somebody said, you should leave your paintings like that. <laughs> I wish I could, but I can't. <laughs> um, <laughs> it required at the, most, at the most basic level, you know, different brushes, different amounts of paints. Um, and so you start like this and gradually the painting finds itself. It was based on the small one, but it's not an enlarged copy. And it's, it's, this is a, a process in time rather than a moment. And this is the large one which is in the show. It's got, it's got the same basic elements, but it's got a very a slightly different palette and slightly different shapes and experiences, and I, I hope you get a chance to explore them. I finished the large crew paintings while my husband was very ill. When he died shortly thereafter, I felt no interest in that or in any other subject. Thinking perhaps of my earlier garlic scapes, my thoughtful, generous daughter brought home many plant forms, hoping that they might spark my return to the studio. This one almost did. <laughs> 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 
One afternoon, she brought home a bucket of long pointed milkweed pods. The next morning, we came down and they had opened up, <laughs> scattering their seed and fluff all over the place. <laughs> They seemed like actual tangible metaphors for both spirits of the departed and seeds of a new life. They were like delicate little ghosts, tiny spirits floating around the studio, but gone with the slightest touch, both presence and absence. As with the garlic scapes, I became acquainted with them using the simplest materials, paper and vine charcoal and erasers. This was my very tentative beginning, the first on a small piece of paper, just 15 by 17 inches, the first one. I just, I had no idea how to draw these things or what was gonna happen with them. Presence and absence becomes the core of this subject matter and of the physical act of drawing it, where forms were literally made as much by erasing them out as by drawing them in. I'm exploring different ways of seeing this subject and different ways of composing it. I know there are many senses that can be engaged and many roots to the heart of things. And that root is always, for me, uncharted. It may not look that way, but I don't really know what I'm doing when I go. Here are six out of 10 steps to get to the final one of the fifth one in this series down in the lower right. It reminds me of something written by the composer Christian Wolff, who I'm very happy to see here today. <laughs> he wrote, I think that one wants from painting a sense of life. The final suggestion, the final statement, has to be not a deliberate statement, but a helpless statement. It has to be what you can't avoid saying, and not what you set out to say. So why didn't I stop at state number six? Because in order to fully translate the resonance I felt, I couldn't avoid changing more things. I couldn't not go on. Adding, subtracting, changing rhythms, creating pause. I find my way as I go in these drawings, making not a reproduction of, of appearance, but of experience. Here's a wall of my studio and a table of uh, milkweed, <laughs> two piles of milkweed and a bunch of pods. Uh, over on the right is a line of charcoal and erasers. I've got every kind of eraser you can imagine, including electric erasers, so I can really <laughs> get in there. Um, uh, in the top right corner is a drawing that I've barely begun. I covered the whole, I covered the whole piece with smearing on the charcoal and I'm erasing out the images that I want. There's a pile there. It doesn't look like it's ordered, but I, I see something in that pile that I want to get in the drawing, and I'm, I can't wait to see what will happen next. Um, this review of my work over the last 10 years began in a bed of garlic, <laughs> and I never imagined that I would find my way across salad greens and stream beds and foggy hillsides <laughs> to offer you a pillow of milkweed. Thank you very much. <laughs> So we'd love to take a few questions for Louise, and Katie's going to help us out. So um, just don't have any, that's cool. indicate to her if you have a question. Hi. Uh, that was wonderful. <laughs> My question is, was that odd, lecturing about yourself? <laughs> it is. It is very yeah. odd. Um, but I've had to do it a couple times. You know, when you're, uh, when you're in an academic environment, when you first get hired for a job, you have to give a talk about your work. And then when you get promoted, you, when you come up for uh, promotion, you have to hire. And then when you get them up for tenure, you have to talk about it again. And then you go and give talks at various places where you have shows. But this was a little, I don't know, for many reasons, there's, this was more complicated, more personal in many ways. Yeah and uh, full of more dramatic life events. And, you know, and this experience at the Hood Museum has been so extraordinary that in, it was a different feeling, yes, than all the other talks I've given. <laughs> but it is hard to talk about your own work and to try to 
you know, explain why you do what you do, but not take away from the effect of the paintings. Because I think when you look at people's work, everybody has a different, uh, different take on the paintings. And what I don't want what came from me to change how you see my work. Um, but people are interested, so that's what I tried to ex yeah. explain a little bit. Yeah, that, that was, was got to be one of the more poetic lectures I've ever heard. <laughs> Speaking as a poet. <laughs> Gary Spirit would be glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let me just say, though, I have to say that you work for weeks and weeks to, to, uh, on a lecture, so it'll sound spontaneous when you actually give it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Katie. <laughs> Ever helpful. A little exercise. <laughs> okay, the next person to ask a question should be way down over the <laughs> I'm really interested about all this erasing that's going on because somehow it strikes me as a as a not artist is that you're it's the opposite of drawing. Like you're just taking stuff away. So could you talk about how erasing is drawing? You know, with let's just leave it to black and white drawing. You're you're creating values or tones on the page, from dark to light, from black to white, and erasing is a way to make white. <laughs> and you know, it's a way to create lighter tones. That uh, the physical act of digging it out of a page, uh, you know, if you smear it up with charcoal, and the physical act of sort of uncovering the white has has an effect on how it looks on the on the page, um, but it's it's a different. If I were if I were, and I want to see what's going to happen when I try painting this because it's going to be a, a different thing where I have to apply the paint to the top, not erase out. Although I could, I suppose, you know, take mineral spirits and get down to the bare canvas, but you only can do that so much. Um, but there's a, somehow excavating the tone and and pulling it out of the page gives a physical reality to the surface that I find truly magical. <laughs> uh, so it doesn't all feel applied on the page. It feels like the page is coming up and making lighter tones. It's the page itself is contributing instead of being the background to the, to the subject, it's contributing to the, the creation of it. I don't know if that's any kind of answer, but, um, and it's also a wonderful way to uh, change edges, for example, when you're using your eraser, and I've, I've got all different kinds of erasers, I can make a sharp edge, but it's so much easier not to <laughs> when you're working with an eraser. So that the quality of edge changes a lot, and, and, and it, it helps me draw in ways that my natural hand doesn't. You know, I can get marks that I wouldn't make directly, and I find them much more interesting and imaginative, even though they come just from the process itself. Um, uh, I think that's <laughs> it's just a, it's another way of, of creating tone and creating presence on a page, and it's been it's been a really great delight to me to do it. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Louise. I wanted uh, to ask you about the relationship. Um, living with poetry with Gary and poetry. Can you take your mask off? I, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> living with poetry with, you know, uh, being married to Gary and living with poetry for so long and being a visual artist for so long. I, I was wondering how you feel those two art forms uh, inform what you do. I mean, how does poetry... Um, have you thought about the relationship between poetry and the visual arts in a different way because of that? Uh, not in so many words. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we, we lived it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's a very interesting question. I think in some ways, they both, for me, they both essentialize experience. Poetry as compared to prose, although prose in the hands of a poet can also do the same thing. Um, they draw out of experience some essential quality that's expressed in a different way. Um, but mostly, in terms of daily life, what it mostly meant was that he worked at his desk and I worked at my studio, and, <laughs> and that's how we spent our time. <laughs> and then we got together and talked, and uh, when, when I was a young artist in New York City, 
Um, I didn't read much poetry. I read a little bit, but not too much. But when I met Gary, I started going to poetry readings. And I found that listening to words uh, was made it much more accessible to me than actually reading them on a page. Whereas I found the opposite with art. <laughs> Seeing it in reality made it easier than reading about it on, in words. <laughs> um, but poets were very appreciative of the poets. The poets that I met then were very appreciative. And many of them, many poets, as you know, write great art criticism. Um, and I don't know. I have to think about that one a little bit of what that that mutual appreciation was. And certainly there has been one that's gone on for centuries, Dec you know, centuries. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's like both of us are trying to pull something out of our experience of life, which everybody does to some extent, I guess. But that's what took all our time and, and interest. Uh, and, and I don't know, that, that essentialization and, and engagement, not necessarily just with beauty, although beauty was part of it, but there's a kind of um, an interest in structure and, and in resonance of elements working together. It sounds very formal, but it, it sounds abstract, and I guess it can be. But those are all part of the construction of art, I think, of all kinds. Um, and it was always fun to talk about art <laughs> to, and, and poetry together. Um, I hope that's some kind of answer. That's a tough question, Kathy. <laughs> You'll have to write about that in your next essay, in your next book. <laughs> okay. If there are no more questions. Uh, I'll just say, you know, I hope you'll join us. Do you yeah, want to say that? You, you, you do, you do better. <laughs> yeah, no, no, just that, um, yeah, we hope you'll join us upstairs for the reception. And thank you, Louis. Oh, thank you.